how to mix watercolors. In this video, we're looking at color mixing mistakes. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Michelle. On this channel, you'll find all things watercolor, color mixing videos like this one, drawing tutorials, even a little bit of mixed media, business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. And don't forget to click that bell icon. That way YouTube always notifies you every time I have a new video. Now, before I was on YouTube, as many of you know, I was teaching real life painting and drawing classes here in the south of England. And I saw people making the same color mixing mistakes when it comes to watercolors again and again. So I'm gonna walk you through the most common ones. Now, don't worry if you feel like you're someone that really doesn't understand color mixing, you'll be able to easily understand and fix all of these mistakes. So let's get started with mistake number one. So when you buy new paints or new pencils, you've got all those lovely colors in front of you. Do you immediately start using them or do you swatch the colors? My first mistake is not swatching the colors of your new materials or your older materials and why it's going to negatively affect your work if you don't swatch your colors. So here's the thing, the colors on the outside of your tube or on the outside of your watercolor pencil or whatever you're looking at, the manufacturers do their absolute best, but the colors on the outside just don't bear much resemblance to what's on the inside. When you get a color like a crimson, which often waters down to a pink, what you're seeing on the outside bears so little resemblance to what effect you're going to get when you put it on the paper. So let's swatch this one. This is Permanent Madder Lake by Talons Rembrandt. It's a color that I find somewhat preferable to alizarin crimson. And let's look at it. So if we swatch it, you can see there we've got this nice sort of delicate rose color. So judging it by the outside of the tube would be really, really deceptive. Now, although you can make a single swatch like this, and I absolutely encourage you to do that with all of your paints to make a swatch of each color. If you do nothing else, just make one single swatch of each color and add kind of a medium amount of water. But what's better than that actually is to make a few swatches for each color. So let me show you what I mean. So what we would do for this one is we would make a swatch with almost no water, and then we would gradually add more water, just adjusting the swatch so that it goes a little bit lighter. And using somewhere between four and six gradations of color, I would swatch this color out until it goes from very dark to very light. In this way, you're going to know exactly what's in the tube without relying on this outside color. Let me give you another example. I'm not gonna swatch these. I just want you to look at the outsides. Now, ignore the fact that one is almost used up and one is full, that's, that's nothing to do with anything. Right, so look at the outside colors here. Can you see how different they are? These colors are both Prussian blue, they're both Talon's Rembrandt, and they are both the exact same recipe. All that's changed is the printing on the tubes. Now, the one on the right is, to my mind, more indicative of a Prussian blue. This one looks more like cobalt. I've got a tube of their cobalt that looks more like cerulean, and I'm not having a go at Talons. They're one of my favorite brands. But the printing process is difficult. And as I said, with this strong, dark staining color, you're not gonna know what it looks like watered down unless you swatch. So my next mistake is all about choosing the wrong color first. So I'm not talking about physically mixing from the wrong colors. I'm choosing about which one of those colors you squeeze into your palette first or load your brush with first. It makes a big difference. Have you ever ended up with a huge puddle of paint? It's gone way too far in the wrong direction. You feel like you know which color you need to keep adding in order to bring it back. Or maybe you need to keep adding water in order to bring it back. But no matter how much of that color or how much of the water you add, you just can't seem to bring it back to where you want it. And before you know it, you've wasted wasted half a tube of paint. It's really important to know which color to add first. So here I've got some cadmium yellow light and I've got some pyrrole red. So let me swatch some of the yellow onto the paper. So this is just the yellow. We'll imagine I want to make an orange and let's grab just the very tiny, tiniest amount of the red. And here I can make an orange. Now we had a lot of yellow in that mix and hardly any red, but here's what tends to happen. People want to mix an orange and they see that the red is probably quite close to orange, at least visually. So they grab loads of the red like this and then they think, well, I'll put some yellow in and it really doesn't go very orange at all. In fact, when we swatch it, it still pretty much looks like red. So what they do is they then start putting more yellow in, more yellow in, and more yellow in. 
and really hardly adjusting this mix at all. So if you get a mix that's gone really dark, really the wrong way, I want you to start again. Don't just keep throwing good paint after bad because you're just wasting paint. Now, in this instance, it would have been far better to start with the yellow. But how do you know which one to add first? Well, there's a couple of guidelines. The first one is the lightness of the color. So when it comes to the primaries, if you're making a color that contains yellow, for instance, you're making green from yellow and blue, you almost always want to add the yellow first. The same with orange, yellow first. The blues can be strong or they can be weaker. Reds and purples tend to be very strong. So if you're making a purple, for example, I would start with the blue because you only need the tiniest bit of red or pink to push that blue into purple. Now, I mentioned that if you're making green from yellow and blue, you should start with the yellow. There's one exception to that, and that would be a blue that's very, very turquoise. Because a turquoise blue is almost all blue. You only need a tiny touch of yellow in it. So you want to consider the color that you're aiming to reach. What does it look like the majority of the pigment is? And which of those colors do you think is the strongest? So generally speaking, you want to aim for the color that's lightest, that's weakest, and the one that appears to make up the majority of the color. Of course, that's not easy, but the more you mix colors, the better you'll get at selecting the right ones. And if you learn nothing else from this video, at least understand that if you get a color mix that's really, really dark and really, really strong and is completely wrong, it's far better and far more economical to start again in another well than it is just to keep throwing more and more paint in if it's not adjusting the color at all. My next mistake with color mixing is actually an application problem. So if you've mixed from a granulating color or two, so granulating colors are those ones with the slightly heavier pigments that leave little speckles on your paper. They're very, very beautiful. But if you mixed a color from them, what's gonna happen is they're gonna actually separate in your palette. And if you don't stir every time you dip back in, you're not going to get a consistent color when you apply. Let me show you an example. You'll be absolutely astonished the difference this one makes. So let's have a look at this swatch here. This is a dull sort of greenish gray that I mixed a few minutes ago. It'd be quite nice for an autumn painting, wouldn't it? You could see on something like leaves that are turning over, going towards that autumn color. Or watered down, you could even use it for something like a concrete path. It's applied fairly evenly, but it has some granulation, and that's because one of the main colors I used to mix it from was cerulean blue. So let me show you the little pot of paint. I mixed a big puddle of it up. I'm gonna bring it across very gently without shaking it. Look at this. I mean, even on camera, I hope you can see the difference there. Now what's happened here is that all of the cerulean pigments, because they're heavier than the pink and the yellow I put in, all of the cerulean pigments have gone to the bottom. You can see it's starting to swirl and change color. Let's take my paintbrush and mix it up and look what happens. If you mix a color from granulating pigments, which is absolutely fine, they're lovely paints, you must stir it every time you dip your brush in to apply, particularly if you're applying it over a large area or over repeating objects such as leaves, you're going to need to stir it each time you dip your paintbrush in. And believe me, I'd only left this little pot of paint for about five minutes and it had already separated. If I was just to dip into the top of that layer, I could end up painting with a completely different color to the one I mixed. Before I share my next color mixing mistake, can I just ask you very quickly, if you're getting value from this video, could you please just click the thumbs up, the like button for me? YouTube rewards channels with audience interaction. So if you like, share, subscribe, it's completely free. Or leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people. I'm trying to reach 100,000 subscribers at the moment. I'm so grateful to all of you who follow me on YouTube. My next mistake is all about not considering the undertones of your paints when mixing them together. Have you ever tried, for example, to mix a purple and ended up with a muddy sort of maroon aubergine color? It's because you're choosing the wrong red and you're choosing the wrong blue. Now, how do you know which ones are right? You need to consider the undertone. You might even have seen certain manufacturers put on certain colors, red shade, green shade, and that's there to help you find the undertone of the colors, but all colors have a direction in which they lean from the warm to the cool end of the spectrum. And understanding this will help you to choose the right colors to get the result that you're looking for. Let me explain how it works. So let's look at this idea of undertones. You can think of them as a color undercurrent. Before anybody goes into the comments and picks me up on my use of the word tone or shade, I'm using these words as they are generally used in everyday language and used by the manufacturers too. 
not in the strict dictionary definition where of course things like shade mean the amount of light and dark. So let's think of this idea of mixing a purple. So we want to mix a purple so we know that we need red and we need blue. Now some of these reds and blues will have an undercurrent that goes to the blue end of the spectrum. So the red might be a crimson or a pink leaning colour and the blue might lean towards purple. Sometimes on a tube of blue it may say something like red shade and these would be ideal colours to mix our purple from. Ultramarine is the most purple leaning of the blues. It makes sense to use an ultramarine perhaps to mix a purple. And to use a red that leans towards a crimson or a pink is going to give us a fantastic true sort of royal purple. But not all reds and blues lean towards that blue end of the spectrum. Some of them lean towards the yellow end of the spectrum. So let's look at those. So if we look at the red here, it might lean towards orange or scarlet. And the blue might lean towards turquoise because these colors lean towards the yellow end of the spectrum. Now, if we mix all three primaries together, we'll get a color that's dull and muted. We'll get a neutral. So if we mix red and blue, we'll get purple. But if there's also a little touch of yellow in there, we're adding that third primary and we're neutralizing and dulling our purple. So let me show you that in reality. I've got some cobalt turquoise here. You can see as a blue, it leans towards that green end of the spectrum, that teal, that turquoise end of the spectrum. So let's put some on the paper. And here I've got a color that I made for my floral set. It's called Poppy Red. It's a great color, but it, you can see, let me look at it next to my nails. It's almost orange. It leans towards that orange end of the spectrum. So we know that this has got a touch of yellow in. So let's try mixing the purple from this. I'm just mixing on the paper to save time. Well, good grief, look at that. I mean, it needs more red in, we'll add more red. But look at the mud I'm getting. It's barely purple at all. It's almost brown and that's because there's so much yellow in these two colors. So it's really important when you want to get to a third color that you consider the undertones of the first two colors. Swatching and studying your colors and also using that red shade, green shade labeling on certain paints, it's gonna help you get there. Have you ever thought what a game changer it would be if you absolutely knew what every color in your palette looked like when it was mixed with every other color in your palette? Well, you can, it's called making color charts. This is so, so important. It's going to make such a difference to your color choices and take the mystery out of painting. And if you are not an instinctive color mixer, if you feel like you'll never understand color mixing, it's even more important to make charts. Now here's a color chart or a book of color charts that I made many, many years ago when I first started painting. Now, if you were despairing over my idea of undertones and undercurrents and hues and trying to figure out which blue and which red would make the best purple, well, here's your answer. Just swatch all your colors. So these were arranged almost like map references. You know, with a map reference, you have coordinates down the side, the coordinates across the top, and then you meet them up in the middle. So what I've done here is I've put blues along the top, and this does actually go onto another page here. I've put blues along the top and I've put pinks and reds down the side. You can do the same for all of your secondary colors. You could do yellows and blues for green. You could do reds and yellows for oranges. You could even do tertiary colors, all manner of mixes and blends. You could swatch if you wanted to get a huge piece of paper, you could swatch every color you had and line it up with every other color. So let's have a look here. We were looking at that example of the purple that wasn't very good. So you can see here, I've got Talon's Permanent Red Light. That's a very scarlet red. And I've mixed it with Cerulean Blue, which is a very turquoise blue. And you can see what we've ended up with here. Now there's no such thing as a bad color. You might need this exact color. It'd be quite nice for cloud shadows, wouldn't it? On a stormy landscape. But if you wanted a real true purple, you'd be looking for something a bit brighter. Now look what I've got here. I've got Daniel Smith Opera Rose, which is a very, very bright blue based pink. And I've got ultramarine blue. Look at the difference it makes. Here we've got a much brighter, truer, strong lilac purple. So if you can't remember your undertones, then this is your solution. My next mistake is not adjusting ready-made greens before you apply them to your painting. Now, when I started painting, I didn't use any ready-made greens. I mixed all my own from blues and yellows. I do now have lots of ready-made greens, but some of them are just very bright and unnatural. 
If you've got one of these greens and it doesn't suit your local landscape or the things that you like to paint, I'm going to give you a couple of quick, easy hacks for adjusting them to make them much more usable. So what I've got here is um, I've got some very unnatural looking, they call it emerald green. This is a white knight's colour. It's actually a phthalo green and it's very, very bright and unnatural. Now, whenever I say that, somebody comes into the comments and says, well, I live on the island of so-and-so this tropical island and this is the exact colour of the vegetation. I'm sure it is, but for most of us, this is not a very natural colour for our local environment. And this can go for other colours, not just greens, but greens are most common. And if you have this colour in your paint box, though it's a hugely versatile mixing colour, it can just be a bit too bright. And if you're a beginner, you may not know what to do with it. So I've got two easy hacks for you. The first one is to add a warm yellow. Now I've got some azo yellow here. This is a bright, clear, warm yellow. So this will give us a bright color, but it's going to knock out the amount of blue in this green and make it look a lot more natural. If you want it to look more natural, but also you want it duller, then you can just choose a duller, warm color, something like a cadmium yellow deep or even a yellow ochre. If you just want to make your green a little duller, but without warming it up particularly, then pink is your answer. Red and green are opposite colours and pink in particular, if you use a scarlet red, it's going to go slightly brown, but pink in particular is fantastic for neutralising your green and making it a bit less space alien and a bit easier to stomach. But if you do, of course, live on that fabulous tropical island, go ahead and use the green neat if it's the exact right green you need. Now we've talked about colour swatches and we've talked about charts, but what about actually swatching your colours as you use them? As a professional artist, I would never dream of placing either a colour or a technique on my painting without being sure it was going to work or at least tipping the balance a long way in my favour. Let me show you how just taking the time to do this can save you a lot of heartache. Now, if you were to wander into my studio on any given day and I was working on one of my own paintings rather than uh, spending the majority of my time as I do at the moment video editing, but if I were working on one of my own paintings, you'd see something like this laying next to me, a scrap of paper with lots of different colors swatched on it because I would never dream of placing a color that I just mixed directly onto my painting. I always swatch it on a piece of paper first. Now, watercolors can change as they dry. They can also lighten as they dry. So by swatching on a piece of paper like this, and then just allowing it to dry for five minutes or so, you can place it next to where you're painting and see if you like the color. See if it's dark enough, does it need to be warmer or cooler? Another thing you've then got is a roadmap for any glazing you want to do. So say I've got this yellow color in my painting already. I tested it before I put it on, so I've got a little bit here too, and I've placed it in my painting and I'm fairly happy with it, but I decide now I'd like to put a layer of pink over it. I'm not really sure how that will look though. So rather than go straight onto my painting, I've got an example here on my little swatch. I can try out that glaze first of all and see what happens. Always swatch your colors, particularly if you're a beginner, before placing them on your painting. And don't forget to let them dry for a few minutes too so that any changes that are going to happen take place and you can be more confident in your color mixing because you've already tried them out without the danger of ruining your painting. This next mistake is all about not using a limited palette. People can get very confused by limited palettes. I've got other videos on how to choose your colors. There are no hard and fast rules. But what you absolutely don't want to be doing is dipping into 20 different colors. And those of you who use pan paints are far more susceptible to this than those of us who use tubes. But it's not the tubes or the pans that are the problem. The issue is just using too many random colors in one painting and ending up with a painting that's got no overall atmosphere and that doesn't hang together in a cohesive color palette. Let me show you a painting I'm right in the middle of at the moment and explain how working in a limited palette has helped me and how it's gonna make all of your paintings look much more beautiful. And no, I'm not gonna ban you from owning a hundred colors if you want them. It's not about that, it's about how many you use in each painting. So what are you looking at here? You're looking at one of my own paintings that's halfway through. So this is what I'm painting. It's called Whitby Abbey. It's in North Yorkshire in the UK. It's a sunset, obviously. And the photograph was taken by my daughter when we were on holiday just a month or two ago. I'm painting a full painting for my patrons, but I want to talk to you in this video about the color palette that I've chosen. Now I'm actually using a ready-made lilac. It's a lavender color by Jackman's Art Materials. I'm using that lilac in the sky and I've chosen some ready-made greens as well. I've got a warm yellow, I've got a pink and later on I've got one or two darks that I'll be using 
for the abbey itself. Now, although the colour in the sky may look quite blue on the camera, I can't really tell, it's looking rather blue to me, but there's no actual blue pigment. I haven't chosen a blue for this painting. That's quite a risky thing to do because sometimes you need a blue just for mixing. What I'm trying to get with this sunset is I'm trying to get this overall effect. Every sunset is bathed in a particular type of light that's going to affect everything. I'm not going to just shove a black on this building here. I'm going to use the colours that I'm using everywhere else in the landscape. Now a sunset is an extreme version of using a limited palette but frankly a limited palette is great for any painting. I could have chosen different colours. It's not about choosing the right colours. I could have chosen any selection of different colours for this painting and I would have given the whole painting a completely different atmosphere. Having a limited selection of colours will really help your painting to hang together. If you don't know how to start, I suggest you start by choosing three primaries or just three or four colours that you like and work out from there. Now a limited palette is meant to be a helpful tool, not some kind of stick to beat yourself with. So as I was saying, I haven't chosen any blue for this picture. The blue at the front here is actually masking fluid. But if I get to the point where I really, really need a blue I'll just add one in. You don't have to stick to these colours as you go through. You can add extra colours but what you want to do is as you work through the painting every time you come to a new area of the painting ask yourself can I mix that colour from the selection of colours that I chose at the beginning and if you can that's fantastic because the less colours that you use within the painting the better. There's no right amount. If you're painting a garden on a summer's day and it's got 20 different colours of flowers in you're going to need a far bigger selection of colours but what you don't want to be doing is just randomly dipping in and out and putting every colour in the world on your painting because you're missing out on a huge amount of atmosphere and mood that a limited palette will give you. If you are interested in full tutorials of this painting, as I said, it is available on Patreon. I may put it out as a mini course in a few months time and the foreground grasses actually I'm going to be doing as a YouTube tutorial for you and that one will be coming up very soon. So do let me know in the comments if you are making any of these mistakes. And before you leave this video, don't forget to check out the video description. I've got lots of free stuff in there for you, including some free downloadable PDFs. There's even a free mini course that you can take for no money whatsoever. Now, earlier in this video, we were talking about manufacturers labeling tubes red shade, green shade. If you're still a little bit hazy about what that means, I've got a video that's going to explain it very simply, very quickly. And I promise at the end, you'll understand exactly what's meant by those terms. You can watch that video right now.